Oh wait, what? I, I'm I'm on the internet. Okay, okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. إذ قال يوسف لأبيه يا أبت إني رأيت أحد عشر كوكبا والشمس والقمر رأيتهم لي ساجدين رب شح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته so today, inshallah, we start uh, the ayat that begin to cover the story of Yusuf alayhi salam from Surah Yusuf. And that starts with ayah number four. Um, the thing to note about this surah is that the story is structured by way of scenes. So we're basically entering scene one. And scene one is a very personal, private conversation that's happening between father and son. In fact, the son is the one initiating the conversation. And this conversation is happening behind closed doors, nobody else knows about it, it's a secret conversation. And by the way, whenever we reach the end of a scene, I plan on reading the Bible's version of this story with you guys, and then stopping at every point, and contrasting it with how the Qur'an describes the story, so that you guys have a side-by-side -side comparison also, not just of what Allah is saying, but really what was known before the Qur'an came, how people thought about the story before the Qur'an came, and how the, how the Qur'an you know, reconstructed really uh, and redesigned our thought process about this story and what to focus on and what not to focus on. So we're going to see that contrast, inshallah, every time we get to the end of a scene. So this ayah and the next ayah and the ayah after that, uh, those three ayah together are one scene. So we're, we're, we're in part one of scene one, but that's going to go over a couple of days, inshallah. When we finish that scene, then we'll compare it with the Bible and then move on and we'll keep going that way, inshallah. But anyway, so with qala Yusuf li abihi, the story begins when Yusuf said, Allah says, when Yusuf said to his father, Ya abati, my beloved father, inni ra'aytu ahada ashara kawkaban. It is certainly I who has seen 11 stars, wa shamsa and the sun, wal qamara and the moon, ra'aytuhum li sajideen. I saw all of them performing prostration, meaning putting their, bowing their heads before on the ground for me. And I translate this as for me, not to me. Inshallah, you'll see why a little bit later on uh, in the session today. So now the story begins. We, are, we weren't told a moment ago who Yusuf is, who his father is. We know nothing else. We, we went straight into his name. And right into his name, we're, we're getting into the story itself. So the Prophet himself is hearing about Yusuf alayhi salam, arguably, for the first time. I mentioned to you this was the year of great sadness for the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. One of the coolest things about this, and I, and I also mentioned in my introduction, that it's like our messenger وسلم, is being introduced to Yusuf السلام, for the first time uh, in this story, and in, in such a profound, elaborate way. Every scene is unraveling something about this Prophet he didn't know about before, captured in the words, وَإِن كُنْتَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ What's remarkable is soon after this, in the life biography of the Prophet وسلم, was the journey of the ascension, the mi'raj. The night journey and the ascension. And in the ascension, he met with all the prophets. And he met with Yusuf salam. So he heard his story in his own year of triumph, or in his trial rather, and difficulty. And soon after, he actually got to meet with him in person in the heavenly journey that is described in that, that, that moment, you know, momentous occasion. So it's first Allah introduced him, and then he had him meet with him in person. SubhanAllah, what that meeting must have been like. But anyway, if qala Yusuf li abihi, when Yusuf السلام, said to his father, it, it, this takes us back to something Allah said before. He has the best way of telling stories. He tells the best of all stories and only he can. Because there's no way, there's no way anybody could have been inside that room hearing this conversation and now it's being repeated thousands of years later to the Prophet وسلم, as if there was a video camera inside. And it's being this moment is being captured and then relived in the words of the Quran given to the Prophet. Shaykh Suhib and I were talking earlier today, and we also came to the realization that we didn't bring up something about Naqusu, that we tell the best stories. I told you three implications. But the fact that that's in this surah is actually even saying we're telling this this particular story in the best way that it can be told. And this is the best of all stories that can be told. 
Meaning, the Qur'an is full of stories, but in Allah's estimation, this takes the top place among all the stories in the Qur'an. And it begins with this place. Now, what's remarkable about this is, it's not a father talking to the son, which is what you expect, like in Surah Luqman. You know, if قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِبْنِهِ يَا بُنَيَّ You know, لَا تُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ When Luqman said to his son, my son, don't, don't do shirk with Allah. Or, أَمْ كُنْتُمْ شُهَدَاءَ إِذْ حَضَرَ يَعْقُوبَ الْمَوْتِ إِذْ قَالَ لِبَنِيهِ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ بَعْدِ when, when Yaqub said to his children, what are you going to worship after I die? Typically you find when there's a conversation between parents and children, the parent is initiating the conversation, wanting to have a conversation with the child, guiding the child in some way. But here you find the reverse. You find the child initiating conversation, approaching the father and speaking to him, which is a very powerful starting point. Because in every scene that's being described here, there are lessons embedded. Here we are learning a profound teaching of the Qur'an about the kind of relationship that should exist between parents and children. And in general, parents and children, and I would argue in very much more specific, between a father and his children, whether they be sons or daughters. So much so that a, that a son, should, a child, should be able to feel comfortable talking about anything with his dad. Anything. And they can just approach them, or their mom for that matter. But they, they, anything that went, went on with them, they don't think, well, they're going to get upset with me, or they're going to think I'm crazy, or they don't want to hear this. They'll want to go and talk to them because they know mom or dad are going to be a really good listener. They're going to pay attentive, close attentive attention because what happens often is children talk and we're not really listening, right? And our kids, when they're younger, they love talking. Like when you pick them up from school and you're driving home, you know what happened today? My shoe, I stepped in mud and I was like, ew. And then I cleaned it up. And then, and you're like, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. And they know you're not really listening, but they still keep talking anyway. Because, and at one time, my, one of my sons, you know, Imad, he's really into describing video games. And he's talking about this character and the upgrades you can get and the, the you know, the ender or whatever. Oh my God, it was so complicated. And I'm staring, I'm really trying to pay attention. And I told him, Imad, I'm really trying to pay attention, but I have no idea what you're saying. And he said, I know, but I'm going to keep going. And I was like, okay. <laughs> he just he wants to talk to his dad. He wants to express and express and express. So there can be moments where our children really want to communicate with us. But the problem is when we are on our phone or we're driving or we're doing something else and we're kind of hearing but not really listening to what they're saying, they pick up on that. Because there's an age in which our children are in desperate need of our attention. And they're not just saying what they're saying, there's something behind it. There's something else going on. And if you're just like, you know, he saw a dream, but there was something behind it, right? So a lot of times our kids will say one thing, but attentive listening parents are going to hear that one thing, but they know there's something else behind it. You know, if, if a child is acting up in a certain way, or they're, they're usually not disrespectful, or they're usually not in a bad mood, or they're usually not easily agitated or something like that, and all of a sudden they're really aggressive, or they're acting agitated, or they don't want to eat their food, or something like that, or they say in a comment, you nor or they take a tone you don't normally see them taking, then you should pick up on, not just, hey, that's not how you talk, show some respect. There's that, but there's something more behind it. What's going on? What happened today? Tell me what happened in school. Did somebody say something? Did... You know, just let, let's just open up. And you don't even have to get it, like, turn into an investigator. But even if you open up enough comfort where you don't have to ask what happened, your child is comfortable and safe enough with you that they're coming to you and telling you. And this is also guidance for kids. When something's going on with you, you need to be able to talk to your parents. Instead of just, they're not going to listen anyway. I just one time I told them one thing and they didn't listen to me. Therefore, I don't have to tell them anything because they never listen. Never listen is a bit of a jump, young man, young woman. That's, young lady, that's not how that works. Just because you feel like they didn't hear you some other time, doesn't mean they don't have the right or you, don't, you shouldn't take it upon yourself to let them know. A lot of times, kids don't tell you how they feel because they feel like they're not going to be heard. But kids should also know you have the right to be heard and you should go and be heard. You should make the, make the attempt to speak to your parents. And parents, on the other hand, are being this, given this guidance. What kind of dad is... Yaqub alayhi salam, that he doesn't even have to tell his son, if, if something bothers you, you can always come and talk to me. People can say that. People can say that because, you know, because 
kids reach a certain age where they stop talking. And they're talking to their friends constantly. Like they're so quiet otherwise. And once they put their, an earpiece on or when they're on their phone, da -da 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 and the, the parent walks by and says, who are you talking to? Just my friend. Just nothing. What are you talking about? Nothing. What do you, what do you mean? Nothing? No, nothing. Just We're just talking. Nothing. And, da -da 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 -da. and hours later, you say, hey, so what do you guys talk about? Nothing. You know, just whatever. They don't want you in the conversation. They have other people to be in conversation with now their own friends. So the, there's a kind of a graph. When children are little, they want your attention, and you're up here. They're fighting for your attention. But as they start growing older, they start making new friends and find more common ground with their friends, and they'd rather be in deep conversation and long conversation and chilling with their friends, and now you're fighting for their attention. And they're like, uh, can I just go talk to my friends? Can I, can I go now? Can I just be with them? And they're, they're, they're in a different world now. And this becomes a very difficult place for a parent to be. But in that transition, which will happen, it happened to all of us. We talked to our friends about things when we were teenagers or 10 or 12 years old that we wouldn't talk to our elders about. Those of you that had parents in your life, those of you that didn't, if you had an elder, a guardian, a custodian in your life, chances are you weren't talking to them about everything. And the few of you that did are very fortunate because then those caretakers, those parents, those guardians actually did something that's a legacy of the Qur'an. They raised you or they took care of you like Yaqub took care of Yusuf to the point where he felt, made him feel so welcome, so nurtured, so protected, so much of a friend, so much of someone who can relate to him that he can even tell him a dream he had and talk to him about it. Right? So this is actually a really powerful thing. How do we become someone our kids can relate to? You should... You shouldn't just know that they play video games. You should know what video game. And you know what? You should play with them. You should know. You should know what TV show. You could say, okay, we don't watch any TV. It's haram. Okay, well, what's halal? What do they do that's halal? How about you halal with them? Right? You should know what they're up to. And you should partake in it. And when you're doing something, you should make them a part of it. If you need to go get an oil change, take them with you. If you don't get the gas, go take them with you. Involve them in things that you do. Like experiences matter more than stuff. Like our idea of parenting has become buy our kids things. Get them shoes, get them games, get them clothes, get them this, get them that. And they, they, they get it and then they're really happy about it momentarily and six months later they're not excited about it. And a year later they won't remember about those shoes. They won't, they, they're not going to remember about the Eid present. Eid is going to come soon. They're not going to remember about the Eid present five years from now, but if you give them experiences, if you spend a certain kind of time with them, you guys went somewhere together, you guys sat and talked about something, you know, you did something together, those moments can become like pillars in a, in a child's life. Like if you think, those of you that are adults listening to this, if you think back at your childhood and your time with your parents, right? You barely remember anything about what they gave you at a certain point. Which toy was it? Or which shoes were they? But it may be that you remember that one time that dad had you drive the car and taught you how to do something. Or that one time that mom showed you this or that or the other. Or that one time someone took you somewhere. It was an experience. Right? So there, there's a, a bond that's built between parents and children by shared experiences, by doing things together. Right? And that builds a kind of closeness that cannot be built just by, oh, how was school? Did you eat? Did you do your homework? Okay, bye. Now you, now you do what you do, I'm going to do what I do. And they're, they're strangers living in a house. And when a child is vying for attention, we're not giving it, and they get old enough, and then you come to like some sheikh or a, a, a masjid or uh, someone you have confused with a sheikh like myself, and you come to me and say, my son doesn't talk to me, what should I do? My, my daughter doesn't talk to me. People put me in the weirdest, most awkward situations. They'll bring their teenage 18-year-old boy you know, young man, and say, brother, my son, he's very good, but he doesn't talk to me. And I'm like, first of all, you're embarrassing him, because he'd rather, he, he hates me right now. <laughs> and you think that you embarrassing him like this is going to make that work out. Like there's, you really don't know your kid. Like you really don't understand what's really happening here. This is not how you correct the situation, you know. He doesn't need some tasbih pronounced on him and then I'm going to go and then he's going to all your problems are going to get that's not how this is going to work. There's a communication gap. There's something missing, you know? And the, this this ayah is teaching us 
that we have to create an environment so beautiful that our kids communicate with us. We're not the ones even vying or trying to communicate with them. And when they do communicate with us, then there's something that needs to happen after that. But right now, let's pay attention to how Yusuf السلام, communicated with his dad. He says, Ya ab li abi. So when Yusuf السلام, said to his father, so Allah could have, you know, it, it, the Quran's words, nothing's extra, right? So Allah could have said, when Yusuf said, Dad, I saw 11 stars. Now, if you say that, Yusuf said, Hey, Dad, I saw 11 stars. Everybody understands that Yusuf said that to his dad. You don't have to say, Yusuf said to his father, My father, I saw 11 stars. The father is redundant, it's repetitive, isn't it? Even if you take it out, it still makes sense. Right? But you notice that Allah went twi- said it twice. He said, when Yusuf said to his father, the Abihi, what did he say? Ya Abati, my beloved father. And then, so the father, father, said to his father, and then the quote has father. Why? Because this is actually highlighting that Yusuf alayhi salam, the go-to for him was his father. The go-to for him was his father. This is Allah teaching us that we need to again nurture our children to the point that we are their support, we are their refuge. We're the ones that, like the dua says, كَمَا رَبَّيَانِي صَغِيرًا The way that they ensured I would grow when I was small. In many Muslim cultures around the world, fathers feel like their responsibility is to provide for the paycheck, is to make sure the groceries are taken care of, right? Is make sure if you need to go to a doctor, we'll take you to a doctor. And that's it, I'm done. I, I, do, I did my part, let me go live my life now. I got my family to take care of. I don't... I don't need you for... Co- just, did you do your homework? You're getting good grades? Okay, then I don't have to, I don't have to take the belt off then. That's, that's the father now. That's all the father is. There's no conversation. There's no closeness. You know, I actually did this a while ago. I surveyed like... I think it was like 200 young men from different parts of the world. Just casual conversation. It wasn't a survey, like a statistical survey. But I just have casual conversations. Hey, what's your relationship with your dad like? When you were growing up, were you best friends with your dad? Like what kind of stuff did you do with your dad? Well, he took us to the park every once in a while. Yeah, what kind of conversations did you have? We didn't really have conversations. So like when you wanted to talk about something, you really wanted to get it off your chest, who would you talk to? I mean, sometimes my mom, but usually just my friends. That's like the most common answer. That's the common thread. Here we are taking inspiration from the Qur'an of what kind of fathers we're going to be. If you're going to be taking the role of a father, what kind of role that is, does that is that? And by extension, what kind of parent is that? That a child is coming to you. So it's qala Yusuf li abihi, ya abati. And then he says, my beloved father. And the ta, the added on ta is a common exp- expression of the Quran, but not a common expression of the Arabic language. Ya abi is normal, my father, abi. But you hear ya abati. You heard that extra t in there, the ta in there, abati. That, that Ya Abati actually suggests two things. It suggests love and it suggests respect. Those are two separate things, love and respect. Sometimes you can have love for someone, but you're not showing them the proper respect. Sometimes you say you love your dad or you love your mom, but you're still mocking them or you're talking back to them, but you still love them. But love isn't enough. You got to show love and you got to show respect. Sometimes you show respect because they command authority. Like, you know, in some places, some, some households, the father is like... Uh, a, a militant commander who walks in When the general walks in All the soldiers are like Stand up You know So the kids are like Living a normal life Everybody's happy Smiling Dad's in the driveway <laughs> Like sit straight Stop breathing Act normal Because When he comes in He doesn't want to hear a peep From anybody You don't know what's going to Make him explode in anger So he com- Commanding authority Is like commanding respect Kind of Or you're so formal With your father That you can't be yourself Or formal with your mother That you can't actually Even be yourself It's kind of a very Distant relationship Right uh, What does the country singer say He's gonna He's gonna hug his mama He's gonna shake my hand Right So Like the mom He's friends with And the dad He's just gonna shake his hand Because that that's not The kind of thing They got going on You know here, you find in the words, Ya Abati, he looks to his father with love. And he's a young child. But he's also been taught what it means to respect your father. Because he addresses him with respect. So, both of those things go hand in hand. In order to teach our children respect, we don't have to become dictators. We don't have to become authoritarians. And in order to show our kids love, we don't let them cross the line in love 
that they start becoming disrespectful when we let them get away with it because we love them too much. No, the both of them have to go hand in hand. And that's beautifully encapsulated inside just the way he addressed his dad, Ya Abati. But now he's seen a dream. And this dream is very strange. I mean, the contents of the dream I translated for you, but I'll, I'll reiterate them. He's basically seen 11 stars, which is obviously a reference to the night. And stars are only visible at night. So he's seeing the night and he's seeing stars. But along with the stars, what should you see? You should see the, the moon, right? But he says, I saw the 11 stars and I saw the sun and I saw the moon. Now, the, even the order is kind of odd because you would imagine I saw 11 stars in the moon and then later on I saw the sun when the, the, you know, the night ended and I saw sun, the sun. So the sun would be expected at the end, but no, strangely, 11 stars, the sun, and then the moon. Now, some have looked at this in a celestial kind of way because the stars and the sun are both actually stars. They're bodies in heaven that emit light of their own, and the moon is the only one odd one out. It doesn't have light of its own. It reflects light, so it's put at the end. I don't believe in a you know astronomic, astronomical interpretation of this uh, ayah, what he's basically saying in this sequence is by this strange sequence, he's already letting us know that he's extremely disturbed by what he saw and he also knows that though what looked like the stars, the sun and the moon, what looked like that, um, it seems he knows they're not actually the stars, the sun and the moon. He knows that already. So he saw 11 stars, the sun, and by the way, he has 11 brothers, so it's it's not rocket science for him to figure out this might be referring to my family. Eleven stars, eleven brothers. Then he's got the sun and the moon, that could be my mom and my dad. Right? And so, وَالشَّمْسَ qamar. And it's interesting, in our, in our personal lives, the role that parents are supposed to play versus the role siblings are supposed to play. Here you've got, I mean, I, I wondered a lot about you know, this dream that he saw, he could have said, I saw, you know, 11 flowers and two trees. <laughs> it could have been any objects. 11 of anything and two of anything else. But of all things, Allah in His divine wisdom decided to show him the, the, the symbolism of his siblings and his parents as stars for the siblings and the sun and the moon as parents. And we know that in the surah, images and symbols are important. Seven cows are important. Seven tall stalks of grass or, you know, of corn, of grain, that's important. The, the, the images that are going to occur in this surah are significant. So this image itself is significant. And Allahu A'lam, these are some of my own contemplations on what this might signify, but Allah knows best. Stars for the night sky are a source of beauty. Um... They, they also might be a source of guidance and comfort because stars are a means by which people are guided, navigating stars, right? So stars are, and that's only for people that are on a journey, that they might need advice. And it's kind of like our relationship with siblings. We may not depend on our siblings, but there may be times in our life where we need some guidance from a sibling, right? And they're not, they're not a need of ours, but they can be one at times. And they can be, a sibling should be someone that beautifies your life. They're, they're beautify your life. And when you, when you look up at the sky, they're there. Meaning you're not on a day-to-day -day basis necessarily dependent on your siblings. But they are a part of your life and they're always there. Like you're always there for your siblings even though one of you moved to Karachi and the other one lives in Australia or whatever. And you've got your own lives. But if there's a moment of need, you're going to be there for each other. Right? So it's kind of like this relationship we personally have with the stars. Right? But the sun and the moon play a daily role in our lives. The sun and the moon are actually fundamental to our survival. Um, I started looking, I had actually Sammy look into and search for me, even the role of the moon, because obviously the moon affects the tide on this planet, but the tide is directly tied to regulating the temperature on this planet, otherwise we'd end up in another ice age. You know, we'd end up in another, you know, the, the, it, it warms the, the, you know, the, the poles because of the movement of the tides. So the tides, are, so it's, a big part of this, the sustainability of life on this planet is the way that the oceans function. And the oceans function is directly tied to the, the, phasing, the different phases of the moon. Obviously, arguing the importance or the necessity of the sun is not something I'm going to do in this lecture. You guys already know that. How important the sun is for our survival. 
As if to, and it's not to say which one of these is the sun the mom and the moon is the dad, or is the sun the dad and the moon is the mom. We could have our own theories about that, and it could go either way. There are arguments for both, but it's interesting that if you just contemplate the sun and the moon, you get something else. The the sun, the earth revolves around it, but the moon revolves around the earth. Right. So we're revolving around the sun, and the moon is revolving around us. Right? And it's kind of like the two dimensions of the parental relationship. You've got us at a certain age where we are turning, running to them, we're coming to them for care. And then our parents, as they, get, as they age, they go through different phases, but they start becoming in some ways more dependent on us. And they start turning more and more towards us, and they're in need of us. Right? And it, they, in a sense, in some sense, may even revolve around us. But regardless, even when they come to us, we're the beneficiaries. We're actually the ones, the, the moon isn't benefiting from the earth. The earth is benefiting from the moon. So the sun, and the, 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 the sun and the moon are actually these fundamental uh, you know, parts of our life. Also, the sun and the moon are important in the Qur'an because our relationship with Allah it revolves around worship. And worship is basically... Two things. Worship either goes by the position of the sun, like the five prayers, right? They depend on the sun. And our worship depends on the sacred calendar, like hajj or fasting. And that entirely depends on what? The moon. So for, you know how at home, if you want to keep track of time, you've got a clock and you've got a calendar. The clock, the clock is for your day and the calendar is for your month, right? Well, Allah put in the sky a clock called the sun, and he put a calendar called the moon. So our entire lives are organized by this clock and this calendar. Those are the two things we keep track of our time with. That they, they, they inform how we're going to live our lives. And this is maybe even suggesting what kind of a powerful influence parents have on the lives of their children. No conversation you have with your child is insignificant. You don't know which one of those conversations might shape the rest of their lives. This is a conversation a dad had with his son after the son saw a dream. I'm pretty sure he didn't think this was the most epic moment of his life. But it's epic enough that it's an ayah of the Qur'an. From the highest heavens to here, made into Arabic for the final messenger for all of humanity to learn about a conversation that a boy had with his dad about a dream that he saw. That's pretty amazing. Historians won't write that in their books. That one time, you know, a boy talked to his dad about a dream. That's not historically significant. Tell me about conquest. Tell, tell me about the great empires. Tell me about their monuments. That's history. This isn't what history looks like. But this is history coming from the heavens. What is important that nobody else could see was important. And so, what that teaches you and me is no conversation we have with our children is insignificant. None of it should go without our notice. And we should know that the one in the highest heavens is watching that conversation. Just like he was listening in on that conversation. And Allah made it a point to recount that conversation thousands of year, years later to the Prophet ﷺ. It also tells you something else. When kids speak, it's important to Allah. Because here's a kid speaking and Allah listened. And he put it in the Qur'an, right? So kids' words are important. Paying attention to children and what they're saying is important. Being good listeners to our children is important because Allah made it important. So these are just powerful lessons embedded inside just what Allah says about it. قَالَ يُسُفُ لِأَبِهِ يَا أَبَتِي So now let's get to the, 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 the meat of it. Inni, certainly I, no doubt about it, I. When you say no doubt, inna izalatu shak, adatun li izalatu shak, it's the purpose of inna is to remove doubt. The fact that Yusuf is coming to his dad, who clearly he has a beautiful relationship with. He talks to him openly. And he says, Dad, for real, seriously, I really did see 11 stars. I actually really did see them. As if he's saying something that's hard to believe. And in his mind somewhere, maybe when I say this, Dad's not going to believe what I'm saying because it's too crazy. It's too much. Why would Dad even believe me? But there's another side to it. When children experience something shocking, then... They add words like really. No, but that really happened. You know what really happened? No, seriously though. No, that's what happened. And there's their eyes bulge out, they're excited. 
So there's a, there's a tension, there's a stress in the way that Yusuf a.s. is speaking, captured inside inni. You see the i'rab of it, in, inni is, you know, uh, you know, harf nasiba. And it's the, you know, and that the damir muttasil is the ismu inna, and that's the mubtada, and ra'aytu is the khabar, and it's a jumla fi'liya fi mahalli rafa. We could do that too, but that's just the grammar. But beyond the grammar is the actual natural language. I actually did see this, dad. What did I see? And, and he, before he says it, he made sure he let his dad know that he loves dad and he respects dad, right? Ya abati? Because he knows what he's about to say might sound disrespectful. And when you read the Bible version, you'll see that in their version, the father actually got offended. What'd you just say? Oh, we're gonna do such that to you? Like they actually have that interpreted. That's, that's in their version. But we don't have that here. He's already preempting that dad, I don't mean to sound disrespectful at all, but I saw this, I don't know who else to talk to. What that is teaching us is, Sometimes you gotta have, as a child or in any close relationship, sometimes you have to have conversations with your loved one, especially a parent, but it could be spouse or sibling or whoever. You gotta have a conversation with them that might get you in trouble because it sounds bad, but you, you have no one, nowhere else to go. You gotta talk to them. You gotta let them know, as hard as it's gonna be. And there's a 50-50 chance. They might get really mad at you for saying it, but you need to say it. Because there needs to be transparency in a relationship And when there's transparency in the relationship Then respect remains and love remains Because transparency helps solve even the most difficult problems If, if both parties really want to solve it Then it's only by transparency Even if it's a hard conversation This is a hard conversation for Yusuf a.s. I saw 11 stars Meaning, let's just interpret it for him I saw 11 of my brothers وَالشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرَ And mom and dad Or dad and mom Either way but it seems that by the time he got to the moon, he got so disturbed by what he's about to say next, he stopped. Well, he couldn't go on. So he says, I saw 11, I, I, it's, re, it's me actually, I really did see 11 stars and the sun and the moon. And there's a pause. And then he says, Ra'aytuhum. I saw them. I saw them. Now why? You already said I saw. He already said that, right? And now he's saying it again. Why is he saying it again? Now some say, that one interpretation is, he said it again because the first time he saw them, he saw them as 11 stars and the sun and the moon. And the second time he saw them, he saw them doing something that the stars and the sun and the moon don't do. So it's like, you know what I saw them doing? It's kind of like that. When he gets to that part, you know what I saw? I saw them... Doing sajda for me. Why to me? Why for me? So he gets to the part that bothers him so much because it's so out of the ordinary that he starts over. That's one interpretation. That it's, it's, the, it's the part that was unusual. So it's as if there are two visions. One vision of the regular celestial bodies, which I argue I don't buy it so much because if it was just a vision of the regular celestial bodies, he would have said 11 stars and the moon and eventually the sun. But he said 11 stars, the sun and... The moon. So the, that order itself gives it away. If you can see the sun, you can't see the stars and the moon. Because the sun blinds those two. So he knows they don't really represent them in their original form. Something else is happening here. But there is one thing to note here. When someone is doing sajda before someone, yeah? Or someone's doing, someone's bowing in the presence of someone. Don't they have to be close to them? Like that's a very close thing. But the stars and the sun and the moon are not close. They are what? Far away. He's already bothered by the fact, I think that I, there's going to come a time in my life maybe that I'm going to be really far away from my brothers. I'll still remember them, but I'll be far away from them. And I'll even be far away from mom. And I'll even be far away from dad. But even though I'll be far away, somehow they'll eventually come close, close enough that they're going to be doing what? Sajda because of me. Why would they go far away and why would they come back? And when they come back, why would they be doing sajda? This is bothering me, dad. <laughs> and now the, now the Arabic of it. Ra'aytuhum means I saw them. But those of you that study even a little bit of Arabic know that the Arabic pronouns are an interesting study. The, 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 the plural in Arabic is several different kinds of plurals. 
the plural for more than one or more than two non-living things, right? غَيْرُ aqil or animals. The plurals for those are either the feminine or the feminine plural. So the skies are either hiya or hunna. So wa hunna sab'asama. Hunna means those women, but it can also be used for inanimate objects. Here, we're supposed to be talking about inanimate objects. Stars, sun, moon. So he should be allegedly saying, رَأَيْتُ هُنَّ لِي سَاجِدَاتٍ The feminine versions should be used because non-human plurals are feminine in Arabic. Or, رَأَيْتُهَا li sajida, Because they're jama' taksir. They're plural, non-human. And so altogether I saw them. The word them would have been رَأَيْتُهَا Or رَأَيْتُهُنَّ But the Arabic is رَأَيْتُهُمْ These are the words of this boy. He's saying, I saw them, and the word for them that he used is only used in Arabic for people. It's not used for anybody else. So as he's speaking, he's already interpreted the dream. And you could see that the part that bothered him the most, the way he described, okay, my brothers will go far away, but eventually they'll be humbled before me. My mom and dad will go far away, and I'm supposed to be humble to my parents. But my parents are going to be humbled before me. They're going to fall into sajda for, for some reason for me? For, wh- wait, what? I don't get it. And that's going to be, his, that's the part that bothered him so much that he had to start over. And then he said, and then he couldn't just say the sun and the moon were doing sajda. Like the 11 stars and the sun and the moon did sajda. Because then the sun and the moon, mom and dad, dad and mom did sajda is all too close together. So he replaced the word mom and dad with the word them, which is less painful to say. Because it bunches the part that bothers him less and the part that bothers him more together. It's more digestible for him to get that out. And he says, I saw them doing sajda. Then there's the matter of the and sajidina, the una, ina, ina. Those of you that studied a little bit of grammar with me, and if you didn't, I encourage you to do it on Bayina TV. Do a little bit of the dream program. If a plural has una or ina at the end, generally speaking, that's for you know people, including men and women. Okay, like muslimuna, muslimina, muslimina. Here you see sajidina, which means he's referring to those who do sajda in the masculine, human, plural form, which includes the feminine, which includes the females. But it's not the inanimate, inanimate meaning without life. Then the problem is, in, in jumla fi'liya, you say ra'aytuhum. So you say the maf'ul bihi. And that, or you say the hal, and then you say the, the jar majroor. So the, the expected sequence in Arabic would have been, رَأَيْتُهُمْ سَاجِدِينَ li. That would have been the expected sequence. But here you find in the Qur'an, رَأَيْتُهُمْ li سَاجِدِينَ The li is what's called muqaddam, it's brought earlier. When it's brought earlier, what it suggests is, one of the its suggest, suggestions is a ta'jeeb. It's a kind of shock. Like, Me? Sajda of all things because of me? For me? And I keep saying four and not two, right? So he's bothered by him being the center of attention right now. That's what he's bothered by. And the other thing that's here that, you know, that, that really deserves our attention is a theory. I'm not claiming it to be correct. I'm claiming that I believe it to be correct. So I'm giving you a disclaimer ahead of time. This is not the conventional view of most people that talk about the interpretation of the Qur'an, including our illustrious scholars. It's something I'm convinced of, and I'm giving you that disclaimer ahead of time before I share what I'm about to share with you. I have a personal position on the concept of sajda, of putting your head on the ground in the Qur'an. We, I believe that Ibrahim alayhi salam was, was charged with the building of the Kaaba for the purpose. One of its purposes was that sajda should only be done to Allah. Because when he gave him that house, he said, you know, antahira baytiya, that you should purify, you and Ishmael, you and Ismail should purify, both of you should purify my house. لِلطَّائِفِينَ وَالْعَاكِفِينَ وَالْرُكَعِ sujud. You should purify my house for people who do tawaf of it. They go around it in circles, circumambulate, I don't like that word. It's too big. Wal uh, akifin and those who stay there in devotion and prayer, like atikaf, wal rukka and the people who do rukur, was a sujud or the people who do what sajda. So you're building my house for all of humanity to do sajda to who? To Allah. Now in the Quran also Allah says, "Lillahi yasjudu man fi samawati wa man fil ardi." It is only to Allah that whoever in the skies and whoever's in the earth does sajda. Only to 
Allah. Lillahi yasjudu man fil samawati wa man fil ardi. Okay. But then you find in the Quran sajda that seems to be not to Allah. You find sajda being done by the angels when Adam was created. That seems to be a sajda being done to Adam, not to Allah. Then you've got the magicians, the sorcerers, and the story of Musa. They fell into sajda. It seems they fell into sajda before Musa, not before Allah. Then it seems here the interpretation eventually is going to be that they fell into sajda to who? To Yusuf, not to Allah. But I already said Ibrahim alayhi salam built the Kaaba for sajda only to be done to Allah. And Allah says, only to Allah does everyone in the skies and the earth does sajda. To me, the problem is easily solved. I believe a shinqiti rahimahullah in his tafsir has commented on this issue also. And it's more in line with what I'm saying, though my position on this came before my reading of a shinqiti. So I'm not using him as validation. But it is, I believe, mentioned in his commentary. And that is that the lam can be used for illa. And what that means is, the magicians fell into sajda in the story of Yusuf, not to Yusuf, but because of Yusuf. For Yusuf, meaning for what Yusuf did, they saw the magnif magnificent power of God and they fell into sajda. When you study sajda as a theme in the Quran, you will find whenever something miraculous happens, people are so overpowered by God's mighty plan or God's ability to and power over all things that they, they basically collapse. They basically collapse. The angels were commanded to do sajda to Allah because they were, but Allah has created such a magnificent creation that they are in awe of their, their maker at what he has made. You know, Pakistanis will understand this easily. If y'all ever win a World Cup, then the, the, uh, we fall into such that because it's a miracle. Let's just face it, that was divine intervention. So, <laughs> so I fall into, when something incredible happens, you fall into such that and it's always to Allah. It's, it's when they saw the divine plan come to fruition, they were humbled before Allah because of Yusuf, for Yusuf, but not to Yusuf. That's why I'm saying for. So I don't believe that these sajdas happen to them. Now in, in tafsir literature, we find people saying this is sajda to takrim, that before Quran, it was okay for you to do sajda to other than Allah out of respect. So there's a, that's that opinion, right? But I did not find a single authentic hadith attributed to the Prophet wasallam. nor do I find anything in the Quran explicitly that compels me to accept that view so there's nothing blasphemous about you know, ex not accepting that view and finally why did I bring up Ibrahim salam? because Ibrahim salam taught his children Islam and he was the one who built the Kaaba so he taught his children Islam and he taught them how to do, do sajda only to Allah yes or no why would he build the Kaaba and then he teaches kids by the way you can do sajda out of respect to others too sometimes doesn't make any sense. The Kaaba is built, so you do sajda towards it. That was its ultimate goal. We are the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. If, and the, that religion restores the place of the Kaaba. So there, I, I have a hard time thinking that Ibrahim alayhi salam had a different version of the worship of sajda in which sajda to someone other than Allah was possible. And later on after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that was expired and now you can only do sajda to Allah. I, I have a hard time expecting that Accepting that as a logical thing. And Ibrahim alayhi salam teaches his son Ismail and he teaches his son Ishaq. And he, I'm pretty sure, even though those two kids are from two different moms, he teaches them the same Islam. And Ishaq is younger. Ishaq is younger, which means the Kaaba is already built. So he's teaching Ishaq the same Islam, right? And when he's teaching him the same Islam, Ishaq is teaching his child Yaqub the same Islam. And Yaqub is teaching his son Yusuf the same Islam. So I'm pretty sure, and Yusuf Haysam goes into jail and says, I follow the religion of my father Ibrahim. It's the same Islam in which sajda is only done to Allah. And there was a house built for that purpose. There was an actual house built for that purpose. Which is why even generations later, with Musa alayhi salam, when he went into Madian, he already knew what Hajj was. He already knew in the Quran, Thamaniya Hijaj. You're going to work for me for eight years. The, the man whose, uh, whose daughter he married, he said, you're going to work for me for eight hajj. Where is Musa Alayhi going to get a hajj from? From the legacy of his father Ibrahim Alayhi salam. So that's why to me the sajda is to Allah and to Allah alone. Even in the story. It's because of a miracle that was granted to Yusuf, but not to Yusuf. That's at least my view. Again, you're free to disagree with that view. But uh, anyhow, so if qala Yusuf li abihi, ya abati, inni ra'aytu ahad ashara kawkaban, wa shamsa, wa qamara, ra'aytuhum li sajideen. Dad, I saw that all of them are bowing before, or bowing because of me. What is so miraculous about me that they should be doing that to me? 
I'm bothered by this dream and I'm, I decided to tell you this, tell this to you, but I don't mean any disrespect. I, I don't mean any disrespect. Now, he's going to say this. And what's remarkable is that later on in the story, there's a king. And the king is a pretty VIP guy. You can't compare the social role of a king to the social role of a child in a village that is the son of a shepherd. It's different worlds. And the king will also see a dream. Right? So you've got a boy seeing a dream and you've got a king seeing a dream. And the king says, this dream is bothering me. Can somebody tell me what it means? Right? This boy saw a dream. He wants to, he already knows what it means, but he wants to share it with his dad because he needs to, he can't keep it to himself. Clearly he already knows what it means. He's going to tell his dad. The king sees a dream, doesn't know what it means, and he's going to talk to people. And his people get paid to give him advice. They're on a salary to give, and they've got a pretty high position to be his advisors and counselors. Right? But the, the response they give him is, ah, ahlam. I mean, you probably had too much spicy food last night. This is just, you know, jumbled thoughts. We can't, we can't interpret that. I mean, you're our king, and we're supposed to, you know, go with everything you say. But we're not going to inject ourselves with disinfectant. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> we're going to go with everything you say, but what's ridiculous is ridiculous. This doesn't mean anything. But a father is much more in a position to say to his son, son, I, it was just a nightmare. It's okay. It's okay. Just here, drink some chocolate milk. The dad's not doing that. The dad's actually attentively listening. And the way in which the father responds to his son, it's mind-blowing. And that's actually what ayahs number 5 and 6 are about. The father actually has two responses. And we're going to spend one day on each response. He has two things to tell his son. In response to this dream, two things. And we're going to pay attention to each one of them to, to understand some of the dynamics of the relationship between Yaqub alayhi salam and Yusuf alayhi salam. So with that, inshallah, I conclude our Brief discussion of ayah number four. Barakallahu li walakum fil Quran al Hakim. Wa nafa'ani wa iyakum bil ayati wa dhikr al Hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Sweet dreams. But pray tahajjud.